Well, good morning. How are we doing today? Doing good? It's so good to be here with you. Earlier this week, Monday night, I did not think I was going to be able to walk again in my life. I've never worked that hard in my life. Those chainsaw things, man, they're heavy. But uh, we're here, and uh, we got more muscles than we had Monday <laughs> in the morning. <laughs> no, it's great to be here with you. It's great to uh, um, share with you the Word of God this morning. We will continue our study in the book of Exodus. Uh, and today we're supposed to be in Exodus 26. But if you're going to follow with me in the Bible, I'll, I'll give you a hint. We're not going to read Exodus 26. We'll be in Hebrews 9. Okay, so we'll be on the other side of the Bible in the New Testament almost to the end in Hebrews 9. And we'll be reading there in a few, if you can prepare yourself for that. Well, it all started beautifully. You know, first the man, then the woman that were placed in the garden where everything was great. It was awesome. Actually, it was perfect. It was the holy place. It was the holy of holies. It was the holy of holies because it was the place where they walk with God and where they talk with God. It was a place where they were completely exposed to God and to each other. As a matter of fact, the Bible says they were naked and they were not ashamed. It was a beautiful place. Everything was, life was beautiful. The word of God was simple. His commandments were simple. It says in Genesis 1, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over it. Then the other commandment in Genesis 2 and verse 16, it says, you may surely eat of all the trees, every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat of it. For in the day you eat, you will surely die. It was simple. Life was good. It all looked good. They enjoyed God's provision. They submitted themselves to God's authority. And they listened and obeyed his standard of living. They obeyed his word. It was fantastic. Both men and women followed the plan until that one day. You know, it looked like any other day. It started well. But on that day, they were going to meet something or rather someone that they had never faced before. See, the temptation was set before them and they had a decision to make. And unfortunately for all of us, they reject that even if for a moment they reject that God's word and the consequences was devastating. See, in that moment, and as the consequence of that one decision made apart from God, they lost their fellowship with God. They lost their personal communion with the Lord. And in order to protect them, God had to take him out of the holy place. He took him out through the east gate. And he placed two cherubim, cherubim angels in there with flaming swords to guard the entrance. Effectively closing their access to the holy place, to the tree of life. But there began the rest of the story. You see, ever since that point in time, ever since that moment... God has been working in restoring our relationship with him because since then, the relationship between God and man has been severed. As the rest of the biblical story unfolds, we see glimpses, we see instances where God is trying to restore and renew his relationship with the human race. He first chooses Abraham as the father of a nation that is going to bring the message to the people. After 400 years of silence and after slavery for the Israelites, he chooses Moses. He he speaks to Moses from a burning bush. And for that moment, that burning bush, that area becomes the holy place. He actually looks at Moses and says, remove your sandals because you're walking on holy ground. For that moment, that was the holy of holies. 
Once God released his people from the bondage of slavery, we saw in chapter 19 and 20 that he wants to talk to his people. He says, Moses, bring the people. I want to talk directly to them. But unfortunately, by the end of chapter 20, we see that once again they rejected, the people rejected God because they feared God. And once again, only Moses has the opportunity to go up to Mount Zion. Be in the holy of holies, in the presence of the Lord. And enjoy that communion, that fellowship with God. Well, God in his love and mercy, he gives Moses a plan to build an earthly tabernacle. It was a place where he could, where God would meet with them. and It was a portable place that could go wherever they would go. It was a great place where God will reveal himself to them. But even in its original form, we can see that the tabernacle was something temporary. It was something transitory. The purpose of the tabernacle was not for people to go meet there with God, but for him to point to us that there will be something better coming. Meaning Jesus, the Messiah, the true Savior. Now, you can find a detailed description of the tabernacle in chapter 26 of Exodus. You can read that at your leisure. But because today we're focusing more on the Holy of Holies, I'm just going to give you a brief description of what the tabernacle looked like. Okay? We have a picture of the tabernacle here. And you can see the outer court at the beginning here in the place. It was 150 feet long by 75 feet wide and it had one entrance. And dread entrance was to the east of the tabernacle. It was a graphic picture of Jesus who says, I am the way, I am the door. Just like there was only one entrance to the tabernacle, there is only one way to God. So as you enter, enter the court, the first thing you will see is the altar of burnt offering or the, or the bronze altar. Or the brazen altar. It was there that people of Israel will bring their sacrifices and they will give their burnt offering to the Lord day after day after day. And everybody was allowed to go into that part of the tabernacle. Right behind it, you will see the basin or the laver where the, where the priests will wash their hands and sometimes their feet as they went about the bloody services of the sacrifice. As we continue moving through the tabernacle, you will find... The holy place. It's right behind the basin. But in there, there's a curtain. You see, not everybody could go into the holy place. Only the priest could go into the holy place. Only the priest could go into that area of the tabernacle. As you walk into the holy place, once you enter it, you will find the table of showbread to the north side of the entrance. To, to, the, to the right side, you will see the table of showbread, or the sacred bread. And it had an, on it, on that table, it had 12 loaves of bread, representing the, the provision of God for the 12 tribes of Israel. And only the priests could partake of that bread. And every Sabbath, they will have to replace it with 12 loaves of bread. On the left side of it, on the south side, you will see the menorah, or the candlestick, or the candelabra, or the lampstand. It has seven branches on this candlestick that will continuously be lit by the, by the priest who enter there. It will be the only light reflected on the holy place. The only light. As we move farther in into the center, you will see the altar of incense. The altar of incense. And in there they will, they will place the burning coals from the brazen altar. And then they will use that to burn incense before the Lord. Now, right behind it, right behind the altar of incense, there was a curtain. There was a veil. And that veil now separated the holy place from the holy of holies or from the most holy place. This curtain was four inches thick. It was made of fine linen. It was made of blue, purple, and scarlet yarn. And there... On that curtain were figures of cherubim angels embroidered onto it 
These were the angels that served God. These were the angels that were in the presence of God. These were the angels that guarded the throne of God. And just like when he took Adam and Eve out of the garden, he put just two cherub angels on the east entrance. You had two cherub angels at the entrance of the holy of holies. See, the word veil means a screen or a divider, a separator that hides. And what was it hiding? What was it separating? What was, was it blocking? It was, it was shielding a holy God from the sinful men. See, if anyone other than the high priest entered the holy of holies, they will surely die. And even the, the high priest, when he entered in, my, my brother um, Hinch Gilliam this morning reminded me, he brought a rope. He brought a rope and he tied it around my leg. I'm serious. <laughs> he said he heard I was talking about the holy of holies. So he better be prepared. And he brought a rope. Because the high priest, when they enter the holy of holies, they will have a rope tied to their leg. And they had a little bell with them. And as they walked around the Holy of Holies, you could hear the bell sound. And if they, at any moment, stopped hearing that bell, they knew this guy did something wrong. And he was probably dead. And so they would pull him with the rope because nobody else could go in there. See, he was only allowed to go one day, one time a year. And that was on the Day of Atonement what we call Yom Kippur. They just celebrated on September 29th. And I want you to read with me in Hebrews 9, starting on verse 1, as the Bible takes us through the tabernacle. It says, now even the first covenant had regulations for worship, an earthly place for holiness. For a tent was prepared for the first, the first section in, in which were the lampstand and the table of, and the bread of the presence. It was called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a second section called the most holy place. Having the golden altar of incense and the ark of the covenant covered on all sides with gold. In which was a golden urn holding the manna and the iron staff that budded. And the table of the covenant. Above it were cherubim of glory, overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot speak now in detail. Verse 6. These preparations having thus been made, the priests go regularly into the first section performing their ritual duties. But into the second, only the high priest goes. And he but once a year, and not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the unintentional sins of the people. By this, the Holy Spirit indicates the way into the holy places is not yet open, as long as the first section is still standing, which is symbolic for the present age. According to this arrangement, gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the conscience of the worshiper. But deal only with food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until the time of reformation. Let's pray. Lord God, Father, as we open your word, help us to look in it. The message that you have for each and every one of us of us. Help us through the Holy Spirit, oh Lord, we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. See, I want to mention three things about the Holy of Holies. The first one is simple. We've already read it. We've already made mention of it. But the Holy of Holies was the meeting place. The Holy of Holies was the meeting place. God said in, in Exodus 25, verse 22, there I will meet with you. And from above the mercy seat between, from between the two cherubim that are on the ark of the testimony, I will speak with you about all that I will give you in commandment for the people of Israel. The holies of holies was the place to meet God. But unfortunately, the way to God was very limited. As we read and as we've said, he, 
his presence was completely sealed off. It was blocked, just like the entrance of the garden. The presence of God was completely sealed off, and only the high priest was allowed in. Only one person, only one day, and only to atone for the sins and for the unintentional sins of the people. And when he says they're the unintentional sins, what he means is people were going day in and day out to bring their sacrifices. But you and I know that every now and then, we sin and we don't even know we don't even think about it, right? We're so used to that sin, whatever that is, and we do it and we don't even think about it. So when the priest went into the Holy of Holies, he was atoning for those sins that the people of Israel have forgotten or not even noticed, and he was paying for the sacrifice for them to cover their sins. So the Holy of Holies wasn't only a meeting place, it was the atonement place. It was the atonement place. As Pastor Brian describes la last week, atop the Ark of the Covenant was the mercy seat or the atonement cover. And it is there in the midst of the cherubim that God would accept the blood offering sprinkle atop the mercy seat to cover the sins of his people. You see, remember, the items in the Ark of the Covenant were a reminder of the sins of God's people committed by rejecting his provision, represented by the manna, right? His authority, represented by the staff of Aaron, and his law, his word, represented by the tablets of the covenant. So the blood will cover or atone for the sins. And when God looked down from above the altar, from the presence of the cherubim, when he looked down at that mercy seat, he didn't see the reminder of the sin. He saw the blood that covered it. And my friend, if you're a Christian this morning, when God looks at you, he doesn't see the reminder of my sins or your sins. He sees the blood of Jesus that is covering us. See, atonement means to make reparation or expiation or to cover the sin. Therefore, on that day, on Yom Kippur, the high priest will enter with burning incense from the altar of incense. And, and he needed that because the smoke of the incense will shield his eyes from looking directly at the Shekinah glory of God. You cannot see God and not die. So the smoke will shield his eyes from that. But then he will sprinkle the blood of a bull to atone for his sins and the sins of his family. He will then come again and sprinkle the blood of a goat. This time to cover for the sins of the people of Israel. And God had promised that when he saw the blood, it would cover man's sin. See, and God didn't see the sin anymore. He saw only the provision, and that appeased his wrath. But as it is written right there in Hebrews 9, verses 8 to 10 that we just read, it says that the sacrifices were not able to perfect the conscience of the worshiper. <laughs> See, it only dealt with the superficial ceremonial requirements of the present age, what he calls the present age, but it wasn't able to transform the mind of the believer. See, that's why they had to keep going day after day, day after day, year after year, year after year. Because they would go do the sacrifice, go out and sin some more. It couldn't transform the conscience. And they were not irrelevant. I don't want you to think that it was completely unnecessary. They were not irrelevant because they were pointing to a better way. They were pointing the people to a better sacrifice. See, they were sufficient, they, they, were, they were sufficient to cleanse them, but they were not sufficient to transform them. That had to happen at the time of reformation that he mentions there. See, he's, he's mentioning the present time, and then he's talking about a time of reformation. 
See, this is the third point about the Holy of Holies. The Holy of Holies was only a foreshadow of what was to come. It was only a foreshadow of what was coming because it wasn't enough. Let's read it on verse 11 of Hebrews 9. Verse 11. But when Christ, but when Christ appeared as the high priest for the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, there's a greater and more perfect tabernacle, right? Not made with hands, that is not of this creation. He entered once and for all into the holy places. Not by means of the blood of goats or calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. It was not a daily redemption. It was not a yearly redemption. It was an eternal redemption. Verse 13. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of, of defiled persons of, and the sprinkling, I'm sorry, of defiled persons with the ashes of hyphen sanctify, sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more would the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, offer himself without blemish to God? Man, I hope you see the Trinity right there. Right? Did you see it? He, through the eternal spirit, the Holy Spirit, he also offered himself, God the Son, without blemish to God the Father, purified our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Amen is right. See, and, and here's where we see the point. I want to quote from you from, from John Piper how he describes this because he does it beautifully. It says, the entire point of the book of Hebrews is to say that the coming of Christ, the Son of God, into the world is the ending of the present time the old, strange, and foreign way of relating to God, and is the beginning of the Reformation where Christ himself replaces the high priest and the temple and the blood of animals and the food and the drink rituals. You see, my friend, that is the central message of the Bible. That right there is the central message of the Bible. Ever since the beginning of the story, all the way back in Genesis, ever since sin entered this world, our God has been pointing his people, he has been pointing us to a better and a more perfect way of reuniting again with him, of reconciling our relationship again with him. That's what he's been looking for all along. Ever since that time, he has been working on restoring that Garden of Eden relationship he had with Adam and Eve before the fall. So the question that will be, okay, so how do people with stained consciences can draw near to God? How can we who have this conscience that is so bad that we sin so much, that we feel guilty so much. How can we draw near to God? Well, the old covenant, the old methods pointed to the solution, but they were not the solution, right? But I got good news for you. I got good news. There's a way that you can forever be reconciled with God. Let me show you. As we read, I want to tell you some things about Jesus Christ. This is awesome. As we read it, Christ himself entered the Holy of Holies, right? Christ himself. He is seated at the right hand of God right now. He entered the Holy of Holies. Christ himself replaced the high priest. We just read it. He replaced the high priest. He is our high priest. Christ himself became the sacrificial lamb. He himself sacrificed himself for you and for me. Christ himself shed the blood for an atonement. See, 
I'm not covered by the blood of goats. You're not covered by the blood of a calf. You are covered by the blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, and when, and when, he, was, when he was hanging on that cross... When the sacrifice had been completed, when the work was completed, he said, it is finished. And in Matthew 27, it says that at that moment, that veil was broken from top to bottom, 60 feet high, four inches thick. That veil was torn from top to bottom, in a sense, dismissing the cherubs that were on it. And giving every one of us access to the holy of holies. See, there was no longer a barrier. You know why? Because Christ himself was the veil that was torn. He himself was the veil that was torn. Look at it with me in Hebrews 10. Verse 1, it says... For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of this reality, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Jump to verse 11 with me. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But then comes a beautiful word. But, but when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sin, he sat down at the right hand of God. Waiting from that time until his enemies should be made of footstools for his feet. He's not moving from there. He's sitting at the right hand of God in the Holy of Holies. Verse 14. For by a single offering. My friend, if you're a Christian today, you need to hear verse 14. Okay? This is for you. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Once and for all, he has perfected for all times those who are being sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us. For after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts and write them in their minds. Then he adds this. I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. See, because where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering of sin. There is no need to make an offering of sin. You don't need to beat yourself up. You don't need to walk miles on your knees. It is finished. It has been done. My dear brothers and sisters, um, if you want to be able to sing, and he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own. (laughs) You sound good. If you want to restore your relationship with him, if you want to draw near to him, if you want to be in his presence in the holy of holies, then walk through the east gate on the perfect tabernacle that is Jesus Christ. Just walk. (laughs) Accept him as you walk in, as your sacrificial lamb. Accept the washing by the water of his word and let him become your light and your provision. Elevate to him the sweet incense aroma of your prayers and accept his blood sprinkled for you as a covering, as an atonement for your sins. See, for it is by grace, it says in Ephesians 2, it is by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not of your own doing. You, don't, you can't do anything. It's not of your own doing. It is a gift from God. I 
Accept him. And you will be able to walk and talk with God. I want to finish with Hebrews 10, 19 to 22. It says, therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, here is the verse, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So the question is, how will your story end? Would you end your story blocked from the presence of God? Or will you turn to Christ, who alone can give you perfect forgiveness of sin, and who can wash you perfectly so you can be in the presence of a holy, holy, holy God? How will your story end? My dear friends, I invite you this morning to walk through the tabernacle, the perfect tabernacle that is Jesus Christ. To accept him as your Lord and Savior is simple. All you got to say is, Jesus, I accept your sacrifice for my sin. I accept your washing of the water by the word of God. Father, be my light and be my provision. Raise your prayer to him. And he will sprinkle his blood on you and cover you so that God will see you as a holy person, able to enter into his presence forever.